He was football's Halley's <coughs> Comet, flashing across the landscape for a brief yet spectacular period. In 1975, Philip Carman's first year in the AFL, he won Collingwood's Best and Fairest Award, represented Victoria and finished third in the Brownlow Medal after missing eight games with a broken foot. Three years later, he and Collingwood parted ways after just four seasons and 66 games. Welcome to Open Mic, Phil. Thanks for having me, Mike. Been an interesting journey, hasn't it? I mean, you ended up 100 games at four clubs. Did we see, did we get the best out of what Phil Carmen had to offer? Oh, look, I'm often asked that. Um, obviously not. 100 league games of footy, it's, it's nothing, is it? And you, I look back and you see guys that have, um, and I'm actually envious of guys that have played 200 plus games. Um, but there are a lot of situations or incidents that, that occurred that you know sort of stopped me from playing more. When you left, um, there was the four clubs. It was Collingwood, Melbourne, Essendon and North, North Melbourne. Melbourne. Did you feel unfulfilled or is it only something now that when you look back on what your career and what, what it might have been? Well, people are always saying, do you have any regrets? And, and obviously you do, but um, I would love to have been a, a one club player. Mm -hmm. you know, I would love to have stayed at, at Collingwood and, um, because I... I just enjoy that environment, but circumstances had it that I, I switched clubs every sort of year or two. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk about those circumstances at Collingwood. It was inconceivable in, not in your first three years at Collingwood that you would ever part. I mean, you were a star, they were a good club, playing finals. What went wrong in 1978? I think what had happened prior to 78 was my first season there. I came across from South Australia um, and I was with a club, Norwood, that seemed to have a very professional attitude. And when I got here, I, I imagined that the uh, the VFL would be a very far more professional um, club, but uh, it, it wasn't. My first year at, at Collingwood, uh, well, my first two years actually, there, were, there was a lot of turmoil. Mm -hmm. The club was um, from Murray the coach and, 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 Murray the present, uh, yep. and, and, and the present then, there was a lot of infighting and, and I just, all I wanted to do was play footy and I'd didn't want to be associated with um, things off off the field, and therefore I just lost um, a fair bit of interest, I think, and um, I did things wrong. And then, by the t when Tommy arrived in uh, in my third year, I'd already got into a pattern of um, probably misbehaviour that he didn't he didn't like, and that continued on to, uh, into my fourth year and his his second year as coach. And at, at the end of that year, he. Um, part of company with myself, Len Thompson, Maxim Wayne Richardson and probably another two or three players as well. I'm just so disappointed in hindsight, I would love to have stayed there. Mm. And I think in a way um, Tommy did the wrong thing by himself. Uh, had he kept me there and um, sort of spent some time uh, one on one um, well, with a few other people. Um, so they played in a few. They did. I was just thinking that, after that, 79 through 81. Uh, and, yeah. I, and I, when those few years, I'm thinking, gee, you know, I'd, I'd love to be there. Mm. Um, he, he probably did himself in a, in a way a disservice. Mm. He probably felt he, he did the right thing, but um, he could have kept on and kept myself and probably one or two others he, he let go. When you mentioned misbehaviour, I mean, my memory is not that you misbehaved. I mean, you were, I think you were sort of a, a free spirit in a lot of ways, but what do you mean by misbehaviour? Well, I love training. I'm at that at that time, I was employed as uh, Collingwood's development officer, so really I wasn't working as such. I would train in the morning mm -hmm. and um, yeah, train in the evening, but I and I always felt the training was should be pretty sp uh, specific, um, and I trained hard in the morning, and the other guys would get at training start at five thirty, and training would go till seven, and I I, I felt that I'd done enough. Um, in the morning, I didn't need to do that much training as well, so I, I would uh, tend to leave the track early on lots of occasions. Mm. And, and that happened when Murray was there. It happened again when, when Tommy was there. I recall one night Tommy coming into the change rooms and I, I, I was sort of jumping into the <laughs> spa or the shower or something, and he said, you better come out on the track. And I said, no, look, I'm, I'm not. So well, just, just that, that sort of thing that... Is that the complete story? My understanding of that story was that you left the, the track because you'd done what you considered was well, a reasonable amount. Yes. Tommy came looking for you and ordered you back out from and the I, shower. And I didn't go. Go back out. That's and you right. didn't go? No. So, <laughs> um, yeah. No wonder the relationship's out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, but 
it's just that sort of thing. And it just, but, um, Phil, I mean, <clears throat> you, we know, I mean, this is stating the obvious to you, but in a team game, can an individual, no matter how good he is, can he set the rules? No, absolutely not. But um, uh, it's just, I, I enjoyed playing. I didn't um, enjoy the environment of the club situation that much. And so I just, as I said, I just got into the habit of doing mm. thing, things my way and um, I got away with it to a certain extent. I wasn't um, held to account often enough. I don't think I ever... I think once they may have called me into, into a meeting and um, explained to me that you can't do it, but I, as I said, I just got away with it and, and it just uh, happened too often. Let's go to 1977 uh, and the second semi-final against Hawthorne. Uh, you for reasons best known to yourself, whacked Michael Tuck in the middle of the MCG. Mm. He was suspended for two games. There's no question that anyone involved with Collingwood at the time believed that that incident cost them the flag. Do you subscribe to that? Yeah, well, look, looking back, I do. Um, but it's interesting, you know, I'll just, if we can talk about that for a moment. Um, second semi-final, playing in front of 80,000 people, I'd, uh, I'd kick the first goal of the match and... Um, I'd handball to Len Thompson, he'd kick the, kick the second, and the adrenaline was really, really pumping. And uh, just sort of, it was still early in the first quarter, uh, the ball had been knocked away from our centre half forward, and um, in a final, you know, I chased the ball down. I had to make a, a split decision do I sort of go for the footy or make a. Um, and physical, physical, statement. physical uh, <laughs> and, and unfortunately, I didn't know who it was, so, mm. and I just ran through. Hit him with a forearm, I didn't think there was much in it until. Until after the game, um, I was shown a, a replay of the incident and I, I knew then that I was, I was in a bit of strife. Mm. Uh, has Tommy ever forgiven you for that, Tommy Hafey? I've only spoken to Tommy on a few occasions since. I, I, I wouldn't think he... We haven't discussed it, um, but I certainly wouldn't think he has. It's hard because he, he was quite a sensational coach at Collingwood because he, uh, he took us from the bottom... Mm to play off in a, in a grand final in... In 77, in seven, yeah. yeah. Given your importance to that footy team, was the action irresponsible? Well, it obviously was, but when you're playing and you just... These things happen on the spur of the moment. You know, you've obviously interviewed a lot of guys that have mm. been in similar incidents. Um, it wasn't premeditated, as I said. I just mm. saw him there and I thought, bang, I'll, I'll, I'll knock him over, and uh, <laughs> which I did. Um, stupid thing to do, but, you know... A lot of people have made sure, but, but finals time. I mean, the stakes are so much higher. And in that case, the year of 1977, when there was a draw in the first grand final, it was amazing. I mean, the, the, the fact the two games you missed were both grand finals, were they mm, not? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Did you appeal after the the draw? Did Collingwood and you go back to the well, AFL to see if, if in fact, given that the second match was going to be another grand final, they might have um, yeah, well, relented? When uh, when I was suspended, they actually said uh, that. They were suspending me for one week this year in the first match of uh, the uh, following season. Mm. So we felt we had a case um, to go to um, to appeal. We went in there and they just threw it out and said, "No, look, you're suspended for the for the replay as well." <clears throat> what about this, the reaction from, say, your teammates and from the supporters to to events that unfolded? Now, I understand your point about you didn't go onto the ground to hit Tuck, but when the consequences were as grave as they were, I mean, was there any resentment from... Oh, look, I, I, would, I would think so, because uh, even though, you know, I've, I've caught up with a lot of Collingwood players since and we don't discuss it, I, I would... You would be, you'd be annoyed, wouldn't you, if um, one of your teammates had, had let you down and you'd played in, in two grand finals and, um, and had a had a draw and a loss one and, and the player that would have made a difference is not there so it'd be a bit, bit dirty on you for mm. sure. Mm. When you left Collingwood after four seasons and a spectacular stay, no doubt about that, you went to Melbourne and took Ron Barassi's number 31 jumper. Did you not have enough baggage without sort of loading that onto your well, back? Well I think they thought that I was going to sort of be a sort of an impact player for them and they wanted um, some sales Mm. Something happened. A promotional so marketing yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah. So they, um, yeah, they gave me 31. Why Melbourne, Phil? I mean, they weren't a great side at that time, were they? No. Um, what, what actually was interesting, I was at the football, the, the Swans and Carlton game, and um, then it just occurred to me that I, 
I'd actually agreed to play with, with South Melbourne. Graham John, the then mm-hmm. president of the club, he, Ian Stewart uh, and a few other people came out to my farm at Lilydale. And um, we sat out in the, the back garden with a box of beer and <laughs> at the end of the night I shook hands and I'd agreed to, to play with them. I actually went on a uh, end of season trip to the Gold Coast with them. So, but then this is I, the end of 78, right? Yes, yep, yeah. Yep. So, uh, but then when I got back, I realised, you know, because Mel- Melbourne had been talking to me. Collingwood had had approaches from other clubs to, you know, get me to go to their clubs, but Collingwood would only clear me to a club that wasn't, um, wasn't anywhere near threat, top yeah, of the ladder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but anyway, in the end, I, I decided to, to go to Melbourne. You only had the one year <clears> in Melbourne. <throat> <clears throat> what prompted another change? Um, well, Carl Dittrich uh, was coach, mm-hmm. and um, there were a, a couple of incidents that occurred uh, at training. <laughs> I recall one. Uh, I think I think I wasn't playing well, and my um, when we when you go into the normally the, the selectors tell you the team, but this particular Thursday evening they were they had the reserve side and the the senior side up on the wall and uh, when I walked in I didn't see it and I just walked in and um, Smithy and a few other blokes that said did you, did you see see the teams and I said no I said what, what's up and they said look you, you're uh, named for the reserves mm-hmm. and um, you know with that we went out went out to train and we weren't training particularly well that night and uh, Carl called us in and um, Said you said leave the footies there, jog a lap, and I'll see you inside. Anyway, um, when I ran past the, the footies, I picked one up and kicked it directly at Carl. And, uh, <laughs> and he, uh, I had to yell out to him. I said, "You better duck, Carl." And he said, "I'll see you inside." And I said, um, I, "I whispered." I said, "No, you won't." So I grabbed my bag and um, went home. I was called into the into the club. Ray Manley was a general mm-hmm. manager. Then called me into the club, and the next day they find me. A thousand dollars, and but then there was only another two weeks of the season, and Ray called me in again, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, said, "Look, the Melbourne Foot." There's talk about Carl um, probably leaving the club anyway, going back and, to St Kilda. Yeah, mm. and Ray said the club's not big enough for both um, you and you and Carl. Mm. And I thought that you know Carl was going, <laughs> but he said, "Look, you know, it was you. It was me. Yeah." Have you always that? been a law unto yourself? Do you think? No, well, I've always been an individual, <coughs> yeah, but I'm not a not a law under myself. Um, but as it's turned out, and as we're discussing this, it, it would it would appear so. Mm. After the break, Phil, that fateful day at Moorabbin. Sensational. <laughs> Let's go back to the start. You came across here in 1975. I understand in your third game. I know Colin was playing Fitzroy. You kicked six goals in the first half. Right. Amazing start for someone to step into the elite competition in this country and that, that's, have that sort of impact. I mean, did you, were you surprised? Did you think you could well, come over and take it by storm? Oh, not, no, that's why I left it so late because I, I think I was pretty comfortable in Adelaide. And I was, as I said earlier, I was, it was only at the age of 24 and a few things happened over there that I thought I'd, I'd give it a shot. But as I, and as I said again, that I thought it was going to be a lot more difficult, the competition, mm. um, but it wasn't. Uh, you know, and to me, it was just a, like playing back in Adelaide. Mm. It, it weren't, it wasn't nearly as good as I thought it was going to be. Your first ten rounds, you played the first ten games straight, averaging 21 possessions. Then you break a foot representing Victoria. You miss eight games of football. <clears throat> Nine weeks out, eight games of football. You come back and you kick six goals, eight, and 11 goals, four in successive weeks. I mean, you were a phenomenon. There's no doubt about it. It's difficult for you to say, but you dominated the competition that year. Yeah, that was yeah the best year of footy I'd, I'd probably played. There's no doubt about that. Um, yeah, would love to have played more footy like it, but um, it's just uh, as we said before, situations just didn't, didn't allow it. Mm. Morabin's big in your football life. For yeah, more, for a couple of reasons, didn't for it? more yes, yeah. than <laughs> one reason. Yeah, one of them was the uh, the game you played at Morabin and kicked eleven goals in the White Boots when White Boots were taboo. Just explain to me. This is not a criticism, but why the White Boots? Well, pretty simple. I um, this was my first game back after um, the eight weeks out. Second, kick six in your first. Oh, one sorry. Back. Well, yeah. I, well, yeah. Um, Murray Plant 
yeah. re- representative for um, Adidas, came out to training, and um, I'm sitting there with a few other players, and he uh, sat down alongside me and um, gave me a box of, of boots. And um, he said, have a look at these. And I opened them up, and they were white. And I was, he said, what do you think? And I said, you're kidding, no, nobody wear those. <laughs> and so he, he hand, handed me an envelope, and... Um, I opened the envelope and there was a cheque there and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll wear them. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the numbers on the cheque? Oh, it was, no, it might have been $1,000 or something, mm. not much. April 19, 1980, does it ring any bells? No. No? April 19, 1980, you're playing at Essendon, you're playing at Moorabbin against St. Kilda. All right, yep. Yeah, you remember it now? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I fairly, don't remember the dates. Fairly please. momentous day in your life, wasn't it? Yes. That was the headbutt <clears throat> with Graham Carberry, the boundary umpire, mm. and... The report for striking Gary Sidebottom. Oh, yeah. Can you explain the rationale for events that happened that day? Yeah, it was in the sec- second quarter. Um, I contested the ball against Sidebottom, and we both went to the ground near the uh, near the boundary. Um, for some reason or other, was, um, I looked to my right, and I could see the uh, the boundary umpire just um, squatting down near the point post, and. And for some reason, I just gave side bottom a, a, a bit of a whack with my, my lift. And unbeknownst to me, the, the field umpire was behind me. He ran in and said, look, I'm reporting you for, for striking. And um, then moments later, the uh, Carberry, the, the boundary umpire, came up to me and, and um, he said he was reporting me. And uh, I asked why, because I, I'd actually, I said, look, you didn't see anything. Because I, I saw him watching the play further upfield, that's why I hit, uh, hit side bottom. And anyway, he, he didn't answer, but it seemed like an eternity he was uh, chesting me. And um, you couldn't touch umpires, you couldn't put your hand on them. And, and he was just, you know, got his chest right up against mine. And for some reason or other, I'd, I'd never done anything like it before. I just dropped the forehead and um, it wasn't terribly hard or anything. And um, he felt a bit of an impact and... Played it up a great deal, I think. But uh, mm. he made it look like it was forceful contact, didn't yeah. he? No, I, I wasn't on the receiving end, so I no. don't know. But well, I think if even if you, you watch the incident, and you can see that it was just sort of get out of my, mm. my space. It wasn't any, wasn't very vicious. I wouldn't think. But even <clears throat> all these years on, um, thirty years on, do you admit that you headbutted him? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 No. Did you think it warranted the penalty you got? Well, of course. Because to, it's yeah, an umpire. It was, yeah, mm. yeah, cool. Hey, yeah, 20 weeks. Mm. Um, that I, was probably, this? I was probably fortunate. I was, was only 20. Mm. How did you feel when the dust settled on that? I mean, you, because oh, in our sport, the umpires are sacred, aren't they? Yeah. Well, I, I think on the, on the way home um, to Lilydale Lily in the car, I was, um, I, I think I was pretty close to tears. Mm. You know, realise and think, what have you this done? This is on the way home from the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you know, what have you, what have you done? And then, then subsequently you had the tribunal, and it was pretty ordinary, ordinary time. Mm. Um, so yeah, I just didn't know for a period of time what what was going to happen. Did you resent <clears throat> Graham Carberry's evidence and, and his and his reaction to the incident, or that was just you took that as that's what happened? That's, well, that's yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Have you seen? Have you seen him since? No, I have not, no. Oh, well, I saw you. He umpired a game um, in Sydney and we were on the plane together after the game. Did you say anything to him? We just, I just, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, yeah, just a good day. That's all? Basically, something like that, yeah. I can't really. Didn't you end up sitting near him? I did, but I, I wouldn't say what I said to him. <laughs> but I, was, I didn't swear on him, but I can't uh. say it. <laughs> now, I, read, I was reading your profile in Wikipedia. Was there a second headbutting incident in your footy career in Canberra? No, it was a, a push. I got uh, suspended for pushing an umpire, not headbutting an umpire. Where do you think that it's not rebellion, but just this sort of. <coughs> oh, I'm not sure where. Where did it come from? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, when you were growing up, were you a wild kid in terms of behaviour or, or, and discipline or not? I think I can tell you why it, why it happened. Um, as a 17 year old playing for. Eden Hope against Apsley. Um, I was playing full forward. Um, I kicked a what I took a mark early in the game and kicked what I thought was a a goal, and the, um, the goal umpire 
sort of just um, put up his finger and set a point. Anyway, minutes later, I took another mark, kicked um, kicked the goal, and he he put the two fingers up. As I, and I walked up and I said, "Oh, about time you, you got that one right." And I, as I walked away uh, up the ground, next minute, bang! I hit the ground. He came out and hit me across the head with a flag. The goal umpire did. Goal umpire, and that's I look back now and I think that's one defining moment that. Really? Quite all these up. No, only joking. But that, <laughs> but that, that happened. I, so. couldn't, I thought it was a sweeping judgment to then sort of say you don't like any umpire. No, no, mm. it's just, but that but story was true at Eden. Yeah. 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 That Canberra incident, why were you angry with the umpire then? Well, look, when you've got the name that, that I had, no, umpires weren't your best friend. Mm. And I think they always gave you a, a hard time. You know, they wouldn't award you the kicks that other players would receive. Uh, I can't look like... I can't recall what happened, but I know that he came out to talk to me about something and uh, I actually just sort of put a hand on him and said, no, I'll keep away, because I didn't, having been in the Carberry situation, mm. I didn't want anything to, to happen. Um, subsequently, I got reported for manhandling the umpire, but there was certainly no, no red bat in that. Was it like the Greg Williams incident? Do you remember that one? Yeah, sim- yeah exactly. Yeah, just Same as, yeah. Yeah, keep away, just keep out of my space. Isn't you it? say the umpires didn't like you. I mean, the umpires liked you enough to uh, vote you third best in the Brownlow <coughs> in your first year in the AFL, didn't they? Mm. Oh, well, that was cre- uh, squeaky clean then. <laughs> so, um, but <coughs> there were certain guys like myself and Dermot and others that, you know, they should have given you a freeze, but, mm. but you didn't get what other players did. Let's go to coaching. You... Uh, You've got the job at Sturt in the yep. Sandfall, yep. Uh, 1995. They were on their bones, weren't they? This great footy club was down the bottom. Correct. Yeah, you had six or seven years there. I had seven, seven years. Yeah. Seven years as a senior coach. I was two as an assistant coach when uh, Hayden Bunton Jr. Was, mm-hmm. was coaching. Did you have a different perspective on players as a coach? Absolutely. I'm glad you brought up... This is something positive, actually. Something that's... Uh, <laughs> We've so, been too so, negative, have we? Oh, well, I just... Yeah. That's, that's all I've had. It can be, isn't it, really? So, um, but this is probably the, the highlight, highlight of my, my footy career, I think. I enjoyed playing, but I enjoyed so much more the, the enjoyment that I got out of Sturt. Um, they'd been on the bottom six years prior to me getting there. Um, they hadn't won more than four games in a year. Uh, my first season, Mike, uh, we didn't win a game. And um, then we won four. Then I think we won 12 and... And we finished up in my third or fourth year as a minor premiers. Um, Port Adelaide beat us. Uh, they had eight players that represented Port Power through the season. They beat us by eight points. And um, uh, but that was coaching Sturt was just just a wonderful thing. You know? I know one thing. You would have had them fit. I mean, I, in the time that you were playing here, I think you were probably the fittest player in the competition. You. Your off-season regime was intense, wasn't it? You made sure you came back to football as fit as you could be. Well, I, yeah, when I was in Adelaide, or even as a kid in Eden, I just ran all the time in Adelaide. And I, when I was, knew that I was coming to, um, to Victoria, I started this. Um, you know, I used to run ten miles, you know, once or twice a, a, a month, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, I was just basically I was a fitness fanatic before I before I got to um, the, to Melbourne. The big test of players in Melbourne, you know it, is running the tan track, botanical gardens. Um, one of your ex-teammates told me you, you were the world champion around the tan. What was your best time? Do you remember? I can't recall the, the one lap, but I know that I ran. I ran four in between. It was between fifty-two and fifty-four four minutes. How do you look back on on your career? I mean, I sense that you <coughs> think that I'm focusing on the the negative stuff now, but how does Phil Carmen see his life in football? Well, disappointing. People often say, they always say, have you got regrets? And of course you, you've got regrets with, you loved, as I said earlier, I'd love to have played 200 games, mm. I'd love to have played in a premiership and those sort of things. Unfortunately, what's happened's happened. Um, you can't get it back. Do you take any pride out of what you, which you're entitled to do, out of, out of the highs in your, in your playing career? Yeah, um, yeah not, it's interesting though, a lot of people, like as we've been discussing all the negative stuff, a lot mm. of people... You know, we never talk about wherever I go. There's not many people say, "Geez, you could play." It's always, you know, this incident, that incident, mm. type of thing. But yeah, I should, I should be pretty pleased with with what I've done. Um, but 
the thing is, uh, and it's your life, I understand, but I suppose it's us looking at you and you know how we all love footy and we see this immense talent in front of us and, rem well, not now, but when we were watching you and probably think it could have been more, that's all. Mm. I mean, it's not... I'm sorry if, if you think that I'm just ha hammering you about the, 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 the dark side of your career, but I'm just probably thinking in an envious sort of way, yeah. I would love to have had your talent mm. and <clears throat> seen where it took me. You know, that's why when I was coaching, you know, if I was a sore guy, I used to say to them all the time, we just can't afford to waste, waste your time, energy mm. on other things, just do the correct thing, yeah. What's your favourite, one favourite footy memory? I would say probably just my favourite one was uh, when Sturt, actually, we won our first game. Really? There you go. Yeah. Is that right? It was Adelaide Oval. Sensational, yeah. That was better than the Copeland Trophy? Yeah, I hmm. probably think so. Because you, with a group of guys that have been through so much and so many people around the club that, you know, we've all been wanting the success and we've just been waiting for it and bang, it happened. I feel I loved watching you play and you've always been a good bloke. It was great to catch up. I'm sorry if there was a bit of negativity in there, but good to see you and good to see you looking so well. Thanks, Mike.